Well, it's nice to see Brother Dave and Brother Ron and Deb. We get the still frame of her. She never gets out of the car. I'm beginning to think she's homeless now, but I'm just kidding, Deb. And Billy is here. God bless you, Brother Billy and Suzanne. But we're a small group tonight. That's all right. We got some very interesting information I want to share with you guys. So I get my glass. Well, that's what it is. I got the wrong glasses. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Maybe they're in my pocket. Hey, looky there. Another pair of them. Look just like the same ones. Now, I don't know if it was Suzanne or Deb or who asked me this question, but somebody asked me and they said they were going to be here tonight about the Holy Spirit and whether or not the Holy Spirit is feminine. Um, you know, for some reason, there are places where I've seen that at. I don't remember now where, but... When I begin to look at it in the Hebrew language, I don't have any feminine uh, part to that. Um, I, so I, what I'm going to do before I really get into that, I'll wait. Uh, I won't do it this time around now uh, because I don't recall now what it was, why I used to speak about that like that. Uh, when you look at the word ruach, ruach is considered a gender neutral word. It's, it's neither feminine nor masculine. But in a general way of saying, it doesn't have a feminine ending to it. So it's generally considered to be a masculine word. The same thing as for the word uh, spirit. Uh, the word, I mean, holy, or excuse me, holy kodesh, which is holy, and ruach is spirit. And it's never, at least in the Hebrew language, it's always in the um, in the masculine. I think where that comes from is the word Shekinah. Shekinah is feminine, but Shekinah is not a biblical word. That is a Talmudic word. Uh, even though it's a Hebrew word, it's, it's not, to my knowledge, it's not found anywhere within scripture. Um, so anyway, we're going to skip over that then. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be going to the book of Jude. I'm going to get this ready here. Um, and we're going to look at Jude in a very different way than what I normally have looked at it. And I need to make sure too. Let me check the audio because. Let's see. The. Your camera that is that is using the webcam. For some reason though, it's not using that for the speaker. Are you guys hearing me okay though? I mean, the audio sounds all right. All right, thank you guys. All right, so I'll get rid of that part. Let's go then to screen share, and we'll get started in this here. I don't know how long it's going to take to go through this, uh, but it's just interesting. Um, of course, we all know the book of Jude is only one chapter long, but there's a lot written in that book that we kind of take for granted. Uh, I have to admit myself, I think I've taken some of this for granted as well. So, so Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, for them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unaware who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord and God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance 
Though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, <clears throat> afterward destroyed them that believe not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Now, these are interesting in itself. Uh, and we're going to be going into that in just a moment. He said he puts them in remembrance, though they once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Verse 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And the word strange flesh here is not a homosexuality. A lot of people think that's what that is. It's not. It's going after those beings that are not human is what it is. Like also, likewise, also, also these filthy dreamers, which the word filthy is added, defile the flesh, despise dominion, speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses and durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts and those things, they corrupt themselves. That's right about there when I was reading this today is where I really began to start to start. It began to come together more to me in a way that I hadn't thought about. So he says, woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perish in the gainsaying. Korah. Now, let's take a look at some of these. You go to Matthew 23, and I, I may have gotten some of these out of order, so if I did, just bear with me. You serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall you scourge in the synagogue in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous bloodshed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel until the blood of Zacharias. Now, if you just stopped right there and you go back and look at Jude again. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the era of Balaam for reward. All right, what's he talking about? Remember what they did with Balaam? They were trying to get Balaam to go out and curse the children of Israel and kill them all. That's what they were doing. And Judah's saying, these have gone in the way of Cain. Cain was what? He was the first murderer and ran greedily after the after Balaam for reward. And then we read in here in Matthew, and Jesus is actually identifying the Pharisees as guilty of the righteous blood that was shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barcaeus, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. So what Jude is saying here is actually what Jesus condemns them for right there. So you know he's talking about the Pharisees. Then he goes on, these are spots in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Think about that. Think about it, right? I think, I got these, I don't have these in order, so forgive me on that. I think it's over here in Matthew 7. Um, 
Nope, not Matthew 7. Just give me a second. Let me make sure I find it. Maybe I do have it in order. Yep, yep, here we go, right here. In the book of Luke, chapter 7. So before I read it, let's go back to Jude. Look what he says. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Now, this is going to be a flip-flop of that, of that being said, but notice, though, the feeding without fear, right? Without fear. Same thing happened with Jesus when he went to Simon's house. He stood at his feet behind him. Excuse me, I'll back up a little bit. Um, let's see. Get to the right place where this starts at. Uh. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And when he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet and behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto you. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor, and we know the story, he talks about that, and he says, which one is he going to forgive the most? And of course, it ends up being the one that he forgave the most. Then he gets on down here to verse 45. And he said, you gave me no kiss. Talking about when he came. Now, he, for, of course, we know he forgives the woman. She had washed his feet with her hair, and she wept and cried and all that. And he said, though her sins be many, they are all forgiven her. And then he says to Simon, he said, you gave me no kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil you did not anoint. But this woman hath anointed my feet with anointment. Wherefore I say unto you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loveth much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. All right. Now, what I noticed, though, and like I said, it's not, it's kind of a flip-flop. He said, these are spots in your feast of charity. The only difference is that Simon was the one doing the feast, but he was the actual spot in the very feast of charity that Jesus brought to that woman there. Their clouds, they are without water, carried about of the winds. Trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit twice dead, plucked up by the roots. That one's a fairly easy one, too, to look at. And I believe, let's see. Yep, here we go right here. Okay, and let's see. And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany. We're in Matthew 21, verse 17. And he lodged there. And now in the morning as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw the fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon, but leaves only. Said unto it, let no fruit grow uh, on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon the fig tree withered away. And Jesus answered and said to them, Verily I say unto you, If you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if you shall say unto the mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast, and see, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. But what's interesting is the part about the fig tree, because what does he say right here? He said that they are clouds, they are without water, carried about of winds, trees of whose fruit withered, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. 
And the interesting thing is, Israel is the fig tree. And even though he was hungry, but he could find no fruit on there, you know, that's still a type as well in the gospel itself when it goes forth. If the, if the one speaking has no fruit whatsoever, there's nothing to eat from it there. That minister is not worthy of even speaking. He's just like a dead fig tree plucked up dead by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom it is reserved, the blackness and darkness forever. And I mean, so much of this we already know because we already know the scriptures for these. And I think that there, let's see. Uh, you, let's see here. Yep, right here. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered. Now, actually, in the Hebrew, Matthew, that's the buzzards, not the eagles, but our vultures. Wherever the body is, there will be gathered the vultures. At that time, after the tribulation of those days, the sun will grow dark. The moon will not give forth its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the host of heaven will be shaken. And Jude even says here, Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And he knock also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all, to convince all that are ungodly among them of all that are ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers and complainers walking after their own lust and their mouth speaking great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves, sensuals, having not the spirit. But ye, beloved, build up yourselves on your most holy faith by praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ into eternal life. And some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Isn't that interesting in itself right there? Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. You know, he's not talking about. In other words, the flesh is what spots the true garment. Now to him that is able to keep you from falling into present, you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and ever. Amen. All right. Now, there's something else I want to share with you guys. And I think, let's see here if I can get this up here right. I did a message on this just recently. Um, let's see. It's in Jeremiah. But I really want to, or no, maybe, no, maybe it's in Ezekiel. I forget now. Yes. Uh, yes, Ezekiel. I apologize. Not Jeremiah, but Ezekiel. And um, this, this is. And because of what I'm going to say on this, I've got to be very, very careful about where I post this video after we're done. They have gotten so um, critical about what you say. I heard recently, and, and, and when I say I heard recently, you know, the thing is that I don't, to me, I don't say anything anti-Semitic in the first place, but there are those that consider some of the biblical passages that we would speak about as anti-Semitic. So, and I think, what is it? Facebook and Twitter 
I believe, have gotten very strict on that issue. So let me share the screen with you guys again. I would imagine all you guys saw where I spoke about this before, but I really want to uh, talk a little bit deeper on this issue here in Ezekiel 9. Uh, then he called in my ears with a loud voice saying, cause you them that have charge over the city to draw near every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men. And there it is right there. Shisha. All right. Vehine Shisha and the Shem Bain. All right. That is six men. Uh, there's your word for men. And um, they came. Uh, okay, let's see. From the way of the upper gate, Medek Sha'ar Ha'alion, okay, which lieth toward the north, and every man with his weapon of destruction in his hand, and one man in the midst of them clothed in linen with a rider's inkhorn on his side. And they went and stood beside the brazen altar. Now, if you remember what Ezekiel did when he did this, this is where they're going to go through the streets and they're going to mark all those that sign cry for the abominations that are being done in the city. In the time of Ezekiel, though, they were marking the people first, starting at the temple. God told him, he said, start at my house. And he said, if, they, if they're ones that really stand for the truth, they stand for what's righteous, and they can't stand the evils that they're seeing, then you put a tav on them. All right, a tav. Let me find a tav here for you just so you can see what a tav looks like. I'm sure some of you guys probably already know what it looks like. There it is right there. Oop, that's it there. That's what a tav looks like. In Hebrew, hopefully, hopefully you guys can all see that on there. So what he did, the guy with the ink corn, he went around and he actually made that letter on their foreheads. That's what he put up there, a top. And what happened was when I was uh, got inspired. If you remember, we were talking a little while back about um, that what was it? Uh, no, it's Daniel, Daniel chapter seven about the one that would take and, and thinks he can, this beast that rises up, this diverse from all the other beasts that ever come up on the earth there, he comes up and he literally thinks that he can change the seasons and the law. And of course, that law is the decree. So we knew from the things that I shared with you that that decree was not, uh, as it translates to English law, it wasn't any of the laws that Moses had given but rather it was the decree that Artaxerxes had given for the going back and restoring building Jerusalem and the, and the second temple. But this guy comes along and he believes that he has a right. And what's interesting, let me, let me, we're going to pull that up. I got to really pull this up. I want you to, and I know I've already said this to you guys, but Sometimes I really just get stuck on an issue and I just can't give it up because I feel like I feel like we're going to find something else as we're going along here. And it's not necessarily, let's see, is it Zachariah? No, not Zachariah. Sorry, Daniel. I'm in the wrong book. Um, do, 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 do. Here we go, Daniel. But what happens we, we see these, you know, Daniel has this vision. He's got all these different beasts that come up. But then this one kingdom, this last kingdom that comes up, right? This is the one that's diverse from everything else. He said, let's see. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I desire to know the truth concerning the fourth beast. Which was diverse from all them, exceedingly terrible, whose teeth were of iron and its nails of brass, which devour and break in pieces and stamp the residue with its feet. Now, one thing I, I'll share with you here, too. When you got brass, brass represents judgment. Always has been. Any Anytime you're dealing with brass, brass represents judgment. 
we're dealing with a beast. We already know that. He's the fourth beast. He's, he's diverse from all the others, exceedingly terrible. And if you really, and I guess what I really need to really start doing is I need to really compare this to the book of Revelation when we look at the beast that's over there. But even when we look at the very fact that Jesus in Matthew 23, he types the Pharisees as a beast. He said, they're a generation of vipers. Vipers is a beast. The very Leviathan that is in the depth of the sea that, you know, when he talks about, can you drag him up? Can you bring him up out of the depth of the sea? What is it? It's a sea serpent. What's the difference? And if the deadly wound that the, because, we, and here's the thing, we know that the coming Messiah, the woman's seed, which is the Messiah himself, according to Genesis, is going to bruise the head of the serpent. They always talk about that deadly wound. I had somebody, I don't think many people ever went on this bandwagon, but some goofball comes up and tells me that Trump got a deadly wound. You know, listen, listen I, I, I will say this here. I feel for the man. I mean, I definitely, I've been shot at before and I've had bullets whizzing past my head and it ain't no fun when you hear that whistling noise as that bullet goes flying past your head. I can promise you that. And I can only imagine what it's like to have your ear pierced in the process. I had also one time a 12-gauge shotgun that parted my hair for me. So believe me, I do know what it's like to have the bullet that close. And it is, it's, I don't even know how to call it. You, it's not, I don't want to say terrifying. It's almost like a shock. You can't believe that it just happened. In my case, it was a my, my best friend in high school. I always talk about stories that I say that I've never told about before where I had a life near-death experience type, so to speak. Not that you die and you went somewhere. No, I didn't do that. But that was one that I don't think I've ever even told before, you know, and that we were out in the woods. We were skipping school and doing things we weren't supposed to be doing. Well, I'd not say doing things we're not supposed to be. Skipping school is what we did that we weren't supposed to be doing. We didn't do any other crazy stuff. I didn't drink, didn't smoke, didn't do drugs or anything like that. But we were just out because I had a four-wheel drive. We'd go to the woods and be idiots out there is what we would do. But we were taking our guns and we were shooting and Scott was not the most conscientious person with a gun. And I had dropped something on the ground and as I stood up, right when I stood up, he had threw his shotgun up almost simultaneously to shoot at the target behind me and I was between him and the barrel of the gun. And just as I was coming up and pulled the trigger, had I been a split second longer, I wouldn't be here talking to you today because I'd have been close enough that he would have took my head off with the bullet. He did take my hair off. It was that close. So I definitely know what it's like to have your hair parted with a 12 gauge shotgun, and that ain't very fun either. So anyway, getting back to the whole point about Trump, though, you know, somebody had sent me, are you going to speak about Trump and the deadly wound? And I'm like, oh, my God, are you, you please don't even go there. Uh, uh, ear piercing, maybe, but not a deadly wound. Uh, no. And I wouldn't think that of Trump in the first place, even if he did have a deadly wound, because scripturally, Jesus, the Messiah, was the one that would wound the serpent. Not down in our day. Now, the deadly wound gets healed, yes. But if the deadly wound was going to happen when the Messiah was here, it had to have already occurred. So if the deadly wound is healed, and we know it was the serpent, and Jesus identified who the serpent was, and quite frankly, in 70 AD, the Pharisees were nearly completely wiped out. Wasn't many left. Now, there's a lot of different ways we could interpret that. Uh, and... Dave, I'll, I'll go ahead and take the question because we're kind of like in a little pause there where we could do it. Go ahead, brother. Uh, well, I've, I've always been intrigued by when Jesus 
calls the Pharisees the brood of vipers. I mean, were they even human? Were they were they shape shifting reptilians? Were they fallen angels? What what's your opinion on that? Well, that I'm glad you actually mentioned that, Dave. And I do. I'll I'll tell you a couple of things. One, I got asked one time, and uh, you know, supposedly this was being a question that was being presented from people in the government wanted to know if my view on the serpent in the Garden of Eden was actually a reptilian. Um, and I remember my response was, it's a very good point. I said he did, he wasn't cursed to go on his, I mean, he's cursed to go on his belly, so he couldn't have been on his belly. I said, so perhaps a reptilian is exactly what he was. Uh, I do know that their shape-shifting ability is to make them look human. And from what I have been told is that they, what it is, is that your mind perceives that they look human. Um, I don't know if that's really true or not, but I will say this when it comes to the, uh, take this jacket off here. When it comes to the, uh, the days of Jesus, I believe that they were uh, not fully reptilian, but they were part reptilian. And I believe that comes from, because if you remember, when Jesus says, you are of your father, the devil, uh, I think that's one of the places they said, we be not born in fornication. We be Abraham's seed. And Jesus says, well, I do believe you're Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me. And he said, this, you know, this, not, this is not, the I forget how the scripture goes on that. But the point being, the reason he admitted their Abraham seed was because through one parent they were, through the other parent they were not. And that's exactly what happened, Brother Dave, over in when, if you read it, the one I quote so often from Ezra chapter 9, when they were in Babylon, Babylon, they had mingled their seed with the Hittites, Perzites, Jebusites, etc., and that was the races, according to Joshua, son of Nun, and and also, um, uh, uh, oh goodness, help me, guys! What was the other one there that was with him there? That uh, I, it's on the tip of my tongue. Can't even think of his name. But anyway, when when the when the twelve spy or ten spies went to spy out the land, you know, it was only Caleb. Caleb and Joshua were the only two that actually believed. But they had said the giants were in the land. And literally, Joshua says that they were Nephilim, and that was a mixed race of the fallen angels. I believe that that is a reptilian race is what it is, mainly because Jesus said that they were vipers. Not only that, we get to... Um, and this is where I've showed you guys before, but I'll go back into this just real quick because in the Hebrew Matthew, uh, he's, he calls them a seed of vipers. And if it wasn't for Nehemiah Gordon, I mean, Nehemiah is far more br brilliant in the Hebrew language than I am. But, uh, you know, we probably spent about the same amount of time over the years studying the language. Uh, but the he had one maybe advantage over me, and that is he was raised uh, in uh, Orthodox Judaism. My family was Jew uh, Jewish by, by birth, but we didn't practice Judaism. So even though I did learn from Orthodox Judaism, the Hebrew language, uh, I, was, I was already an adult by the time I started. Very young, but, but still an adult. Anyway, right here is where it's at. Uh, Nachashim. He said they're serpents, and then he said zara uh, safanim. That is literally the word zara means they are. And, and here's what's interesting: it's not zarim, it's zara. It's a singular, all right. But yet it is in the plural of the serpents. So what does that mean? I mean that's so powerful. It's, it's uh, how would I even explain that? Um, if the way I understand it, when he says they're a seed of the serpents, he's talking about 
they are from the original serpent, is what he's saying. Zara, the seed of the serpent. And that kind of goes back. I remember, and I'll I'll make sure I say this now because I know that debate came up one time with Tobia Singer. Tobia was arguing that uh, the word seed in Hebrew was not plural. He said, well, Paul was basically, he considered Paul to be a flat out idiot on the Hebrew language, he says, because the word seed is singular. And he said, whereas Paul said, you know, uh, he said, that, talking about the Messiah, he said it was seed singular, not seeds plural. And he said in the Hebrew language, we just say zara. We never say zarim. But he's incorrect on that because in the, uh, uh, in the actual Dead Sea Scrolls, I have found it in three places where the word zarim was actually used for the word seeds plural. And specifically, in one case, it was speaking about the very fall that Ezra wrote about, and uh, and the the uh, they were the commentators were commenting on Z uh, 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 Ezra's writing there, and he talked about how that they had they, they had they had mingled their seed, and he uses Zarim. Uh, in other words, their children had mingled in amongst the seed of these fallen ones and then he uses the singular in there so it is definitely a plural so i guess dave i, I don't know how how if i answered that question sufficiently or not there but uh that's kind of the thought i have there so um let's see let's go back then to oh, i guess i can still say the same thing there um but back to Ezekiel. So what so what got, got really got my attention here was when I'm looking at Ezekiel here and we're looking at uh, we're, okay, we were over, actually over in Daniel and I see this beast and uh, that we have right here. And he's wanting to actually change, you know, he thinks that he can change. The season and, of course, the uh, uh, the the decree that Artaxerxes has given, and it says it's going to be given to his hand. So that means we're this beast kingdom that's got to rise. The way you know what the beast kingdom is is the this, the, the simplest thing. Let me just go we'll go right here. And he shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. That's literally the word holy ones is what he says there. And he shall think to change the seasons and the decree. But notice what it says too in the green right there. They shall be given into his hand until a time's time and a half a time. That's like normally we look at that as a three and a half year tribulation. That's kind of the way most people interpret that part there. But the thing that gets me is... This is Daniel talking about that fourth kingdom that's diverse from all the rest. It's a beast that's over that kingdom. He's such a, a wicked, evil beast. He's got these 10 kings that, you know, that he controls on the earth. And he's going to put down three of those kings. Which kind of makes me wonder if it's not some of the world powers that he puts down. Oddly enough, we see Russia, the United States, and could there be one other country that would be considered part of that where he puts it down? I don't really know the answer to that, but the way you know who this beast is is because he wants to change the season from Artaxerxes talking about Jerusalem being reestablished in the second temple for the coming of the Messiah, which Artaxerxes never says for the coming of the Messiah. He only says so that the decree that, that their God had given could be fulfilled. Well, the only decree that God had given regards to that was the coming of the Messiah. So who else on this planet could ever be that would be there that could fulfill the 
changing the idea that the building of the temple that happened 2,500 years ago when the Jews come back from Persia, they could say the Jews, and here's the thing though, the Jews had to be dispersed all over again and there had to be a return and not just of any Jews either. It has to be Pharisaic Jews because it has to be of the bloodline of the Pharisees because they are what? They are the serpents, according to what Jesus says in Matthew 23. And also because Jesus, being the true Messiah, was the one that wounded their head. He And, and you know, there's a lot of ways we could look at that wound. We could look at it as 70 AD, when that was fulfilled, the temple is destroyed, uh, the Pharisees, most of them are killed, what are not, are gone into captivity. Or we could even say that when he exposed them for who they were, that was the deadly wound that they received. I don't know which one it would necessarily be, and I don't think that part is as significant as the fact that, one, the Pharisaic dynasty, because they are the same race as they were before, must return, must try to come back into power, and they must also be determined to bring forth the third, or in this case here, the temple again, but what they call the third temple, because they're changing the decree of Artaxerxes, because Artaxerxes, his decree was fulfilled already. So they have to change the season, build the temple, and it's going to happen because it says it'll be given to his hand. So he's going to be successful. But the scary thing is, says here, but the judgment shall sit and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and be destroyed until the end. So he does lose, but not in the beginning. He gets a particular set of time to be able to carry out the evil that he wants to do on this earth. And he's not going to stop until, like I said, the other part of this. And by the way, keep in mind, Jesus in Matthew, in the Hebrew Matthew, you know how we see where Jesus says, when you see uh, the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, no, okay, the summer is not. In the Hebrew Matthew, Jesus says, when you see the Antichrist, that is the abomination that makes desolation, so the Hebrew Matthew clearly tells you what the abomination of desolation is. It's the Antichrist it's himself. When he's standing in the holy place, that's the important thing, right? That's how you know it wasn't fulfilled 2,000 years ago. Because Jesus is not the Antichrist. He's the real Christ. He is a true anointed Messiah. But when you see the substitute of Jesus Christ come, that's what Antichrist means. It doesn't mean against. It actually means in place of. So when you see a Messiah figure that they call a Messiah figure standing in the place of Jesus Christ in the temple, that's what they're talking about when they say the holy place. He said, then you know that time is nigh. Now you know it's come to an end. This is when you better do some serious fleeing, he says, because why? Well, it's going to be, see, now here's the thing. If we know, if we know, and we know this for a fact, that the Antichrist, the word Antichrist, as I mentioned to you before, is not against Christ. It's a similitude. It's a replacement of the Messiah. That's what the Greek word actually means. It's in place of. Then what would be the mark of the beast? It would be something that was just like the original, but it's in place of. That's my, that's my theory. I don't say that's exactly right. I just say that's my theory. That's where I get from Ezekiel. Because in Ezekiel, there was a time where in those that really stood for what they considered to be truth then, they marked those that were considered, we'll say, to be righteous at that time. 
Well, if you have an antichrist, a Messiah that's not the real, but he's in place of that real one, then we have to have an antique mark, a mark that's in place of the real. So the mark, and notice the revelation said it's the mark of the beast. Well, the beast is the one that's going to bring about the third temple. Or at least he's the one that's going to change the season and the decree so the temple can be built. So he's going to also be the one that brings forth the mark. So what's the mark going to do? It's going to mimic, I believe, what Ezekiel was talking about. And they're going to put a mark on the head of those people that do what? Sign cry for the abominations that are done. In other words, it'll be for, they're going to say, it's for those Christians, for example, that are standing for Israel, that are speaking out against the anti-Semitism that's going on around the world, that speak up for Israel. They're going to be marked. They're going to take it gladly. They won't realize that it's a mark that's of the beast because they've not recognized who the beast really is. They failed to realize the beast was wounded by the Messiah. If the seed of the woman is the one to wound the beast, then he had to have wounded the beast when he was here, and he only identified one group being the beast. And they're wounded, but they come back, and they're still called a beast, and they come back to build a temple again. And oddly enough, as I pointed out the other day when I did this message, one thing I said, I said, what's fascinating, there's six men with a destroying weapon, just like the seven Noahide laws. Six of those laws, and they look, they look almost identical to the Ten Commandments. The only difference between those and the Ten Commandments is the fact that in the Talmud, where they're written at, where they're taken from the law, they're actually taken from what? The law of the kings. Now, isn't that fascinating in itself? Because when Daniel talks about over here that this beast that comes up, there's ten kings, three of them get put down, but there's kings, right? The law of the kings. Huh. that's another interesting point right and as for the ten horns out of this kingdom shall ten kings arise and another shall arise after them and he shall be diverse from the former and he shall put down three kings what's ten minus three brother Ron I think you're pretty good at math aren't you brother ten minus three right seven Oh, what do you know? The seven Noahide laws, the law of the kings. Isn't that interesting? That's where, that's exactly where it is in the Talmud, the law of the kings. And six of those laws, according to the Talmud, they have what they call the sub-laws, which are basically, if you violate, like for example, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. We know that from Genesis, or excuse me, from uh, Exodus, where Moses gives the Ten Commandments. I have no problem with the Ten Commandments whatsoever. Then you see people will ask me, oh, why do you have any problem with the Noahide laws? Because they look just like that. We're just not keeping the Sabbath and a few other things because we're Gentiles. Well, I'm not, but I mean, I get the point, right? I get the point. The problem is... When Moses gave the Ten Commandments, he didn't give us a bunch of sub-laws that says, oh, by the way, go whack off the guy's head because he believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Whoa, you didn't know that? Yeah. Yeah. You cannot believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's one of the sub-laws. Why do you think there are rabbis out there, prominently well-known rabbis, like Rabbi Mitzrachi, for example, who has said, now he actually names all these different religions, but then he throwed in Christianity, 
And he said, one, what was it? What was it? I forget now. One billion Christians, he said, all idolaters. He said, and according to the Torah, they all must die. Oh my gosh, are you serious? Remember what Jesus did? The Caiaphas says, he said, are you the son of God? He said, thou sayest. He didn't even say it. He just said, you say it. He rips his clothes and he said, what further need? You've heard his blasphemy. He must die. So if you dare claim Jesus Christ to be the son of God, you will have violated that law. In every single one of those laws, according to the Talmud, where they're from, the law of the kings is punishable by death. What I need to do, and I've done this in the past with me and Yana, because Yana is the one that really, she was the true warrior about the Noahide laws. And at that time, we actually took the, the Talmud and we shared and showed you right where it's written at. And we showed you some of those sub laws. I believe it was uh, Rabbi. Uh, let me think now. Oh goodness, I can't think of his name right offhand. There was one rabbi that was uh, that's also very prominent, uh, and uh, he was saying there are hundreds of sub laws to the Noahide laws. Hundreds. I don't know if there's hundreds, but there is a lot. That's true. There is a lot of sub laws. But like in this six right here, six of those laws, you can lose your life. But the seventh law, just like the guy with the ink horn, all the guy with the ink horn did is he's the one that determined if you were righteous or not righteous. That's what the seventh law is in the Noahide laws. It is to set up courts of justice. I remember one day there was a minister, and you guys already know who it is. I won't call his name, but uh, you know who I'm talking about. He says, those people out there talking about the Noahide laws, he said, the Jews are not going to go around killing people. Okay, that's a lie. They're not going to go out there and kill nobody. Of course not. Do you think they went out and killed Jesus? Even though the scripture clearly, I mean, Peter just said right out, be it known to you, O house of Israel, that same Jesus whom you have crucified has been made both Lord and Christ. There's still, there's still mercy even after that. That's not the point. The point is, it, it, it's true. All right. So the thing is, kind of lost my thought where I was at there for a second, but, uh, but, oh, I know what I was going to say. Just like what they did, they took and they handed him over to the Roman curator at the time or, or the Roman um, uh, governor, Pilate. And Pilate, after he, you know, he, he questions him, judges him, scourges him, sends him back. He says, I don't find any fault in him. He says, you know, they said, well, according to our law, he ought to die. They said, well, then take him out and judge him according to your law. But we can't do it. You got to do it. It's no different. It'll be the exact same way today. That's why they want to set up courts of justice. That's why there will be those that will be marked. And by the way, those that take the mark of the beast, they'll be the ones setting up the courts of justice to behead all those that are considered anti-Semites. And I'm sure they'll be very doing it very thrillingly. Very Remember the scripture says a time will come, they think, to do God a service by killing you. The people, there they really believe it. I mean, this is why I feel for them. They really believe that they're going to be doing God a service by taking your life. They will think that they're really fulfilling. Well, they'll, they will be fulfilling scripture, but it just won't be in a good way. Think of that. 
Anyway, I'm going to pause, guys. I see it just four of us looks like now left. And uh, you guys have anything you want to add to this, go right ahead. You can just unmute the mic. It won't matter. So, and how long? Well, I didn't talk too long. Look at there. I wasn't too long-winded. Ah. Y'all are all in shock. I can see it on your face. Dave and Ron both are in shock. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I thought she did. She's, did pretty she's good probably on that. in shock too. Oh God. Brought out some good points I hadn't looked at before. I like that. Well, you know, I tell you one that caught my attention, and I hadn't thought about it until we were talking just now, and that was the Ten King. I didn't think about when he does away with three of them, you have seven left. Yeah. And and yet, let me see if I can pull this up real quick. I want to show you guys this. Maybe, especially we're recording anyway, so who knows? Maybe we'll find it. Let me close some of these out just to get, so I don't wear out too much of the energy in the computer here. Uh, all right, let's see here. That would be... Um, Talmud, Book of Kings, Noahide Laws. Let's see. 56A, Noah commanded his children to set up governments. Okay, here we go. So, right, so Sanhedrin 56A. Let me let's see if I can pull up the... Uh, I'm going to tell me no. Plan B. Uh, there we go. I think that would be it. There we go. No hide laws. Yeah, 56A. Okay, since the Holocaust of descendants of Noah have been mentioned, a full discussion of Noah hide mitzvot, which means laws, is presented to the set. Oh, goodness. It would have. Oh, wait a minute. Do you, am I even got you guys where y'all can see that? Let me find you. Nope. Let me, let me share a screen so y'all can see that. Doop, doop, doop. Here we go. All right. The descendants of Noah, i.e. all the humanity, were commanded to observe the seven mitzvot, or seven laws. The mitzvah of the establishing courts of judgment and the prohibition against blessings, i.e. cursing the name of God, the prohibition of idol worship, uh, prohibition against forbidden sexual relations, uh, bloodshed, robbery. And of course, these are the Hebrew versions of those laws, but it continues on. Also committed concerning the prohibition against consuming the blood from a living animal. Uh, Oh, goodness. Yeah, sorcery. By the way, anything that a rabbi comments in here on these laws is considered to be that law as well. Um, so, and, and they believe that it's stronger than the laws of God himself. Let's see. We're finishing these practices. Clearly prohibited. The descendants and also also a command concerning the prohibition of diverse kinds. To wear diverse. Okay, so yeah, you won't be able to wear wool and linen. In other words, you can't wear cotton uh, and something made from an animal skin either at the same time, by the way, just so you guys know that. Let's see. Um uh, Trying to find the ones where they talk about beheading you because that's in there. It's actually in this section right here, but also too. Um, well, here we go. Still do not. Uh, 
Let's see, Adam first command of six commandments. See, this is all where they claim it comes from, but none of it's, I mean, we have no, they they try to find scriptural evidence to support it, but it's not, it's just not true. Um, Now, this is the dangerous part right here, right? Rabbi Menachai Mendel Schneerson, the love of Rabbi, April 2nd, 1985. The point of the seven Noahide laws is to settle the world. Through these laws, war and famine will be negated. As Rambam writes in the Messianic era, there will be no famine, no war. By the way, Rambam is the one that put the seven Noahide laws in the Talmud, okay? And he, like I said, he put it in the, in the thing called the Law of the Kings. Um, uh, Situated countries that Jews' relationship with non Jews, Hashem has made us, us. Oh, by the way, that's also considered to be a forbidden marriage. And that will be if you're married, if you're Jewish and you're married to a Gentile or vice versa, uh, they will separate you. I've actually seen that happen in Israel uh, in modern times. Uh, I have a friend of mine who was an attorney over there, and he was Jewish. His wife was uh, from the uh, uh, Far East, I think, from the Philippines or something like that. And they they threw her out of the country and demanded that he divorce her. He spent about four years fighting to get his wife back. So, okay. There's more to it than just this. This is uh, this kind of narrowed it down to where I couldn't see everything that I wanted to see. I was trying to find the part about the uh, Law of the Kings, but I actually have it on my bookshelf in Tennessee, but I'm down in Florida right now, so I can't share all that with you guys. But anyway, yeah, that's what I kind of thought was neat was that I wasn't thinking about the part about the kings, and then I saw that, and I'm like, wow, that's kind of interesting. So... All right, so if you guys don't have any questions, I'm, we're going to close for tonight. I got to catch a plane in the morning, so I got to get up early anyway. And uh, I'm going to go down to Orlando. So I'll tell you, Brother uh, Ron, how that how that meeting goes down there. And I'll see if I can't get a meeting with you. And uh, I know that's a long shot, right, with you and David, right? I'll tell him that I know the smartest guy that would that could help him learn about his own product. <laughs> well, yeah, don't lie about it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Dave, have you ever tried those lightweight patches I talk about? Yeah, in fact, I'm on my second month right now. You know, and, Ron, he just and, had the, his doctor uh, is going nuts over it because now. He, he thinks that maybe his thyroid has grown back because he had to quit taking thyroid medication. Well, that's kind of what I'm hoping for. You know, I'm paraplegic incomplete from an accident I had four years ago. Um, I'm work, I'm going to the gym four or five days a week. I mean, I can walk with a walker. I can, I'm driving now and all that, but I was bedridden for a year and spent a year in a nursing home. But I'm, I've had some... Some uh, my thyroid's good, but I've had had some issues with my prostate and and getting up, you know, four or five times a night. And I think it's starting to help with that to reduce yeah. uh, swelling of my prostate. And I've noticed I don't have as much nerve pain in my right side as I did. So it's I don't have any miracle, you know, four or five day uh, thing that happened. But but I'm just going to keep keep with it and see what it does. I think you're kind of like myself, Dave. Uh, Ron was pretty much, I think, the same too. It took time for him. Uh, I had the prostate issue as well, and it was about seven months after using it that I finally didn't have to get up and go to the bathroom at night anymore at all. Uh, and like you, I was five times a night easy. And uh, and then the other thing too that I'll tell you that uh, that I experienced was. Uh, uh, and this is, you might want to try it. Ron's the one that told me about this. And that's where I took the Eon patches and I placed it behind the ears right there on the skull bones on each side. 
and then one on the base of the back of the head, right there at the bottom, and then right on the center of the top of the head. And because mm -hmm. I was, I, I still have swelling in my legs and they believe this caused uh, not from congestive heart failure, but from uh, uh, partial paralysis of my legs. And I was telling Ron, because I was really getting to the place to where getting up and down the stairs, I really, it was a challenge. Um, you know, we, in Tennessee, we have stairs there. I don't have them here in Florida, but I coming down especially, I was always afraid I was going to go tumbling down the stairs. So I held onto the rail really tight both sides, and I would just have to go slow. And one leg I had more control of than the other, so it's you have to do a lot of thinking, you know, when your legs are like that, which I'm sure you know that yourself. Um, but Ron told me, he said, try that. And so I did. And the Eon Patrick? Eon. Eon. Yeah, just Eon. Okay. Uh, okay. I don't know, Dave, if I would do it long term, but right. the very next morning, I still. You know, you could still feel the stiffness like in the knees, you know, because of the numbness. I don't feel my knees very well. Uh, yeah. But I wasn't even thinking about it. I got up, I went to the bathroom, and I came back. And when I got back in bed, I started thinking about it. I'm like, wait a minute. I mean, normally to get up, when I first get up, that's anytime I'm, even if I lay down or if I'm driving, to walk afterwards is really, really hard. Uh, that's when I would have the most problems because for I don't and you would think laying down it'd be better, but no. When I wake up, my legs are literally it's almost like I can't even feel them. You know, it's like they went to sleep in the night. But I woke up, I walked to the bathroom like it was nothing, and then I started thinking about. It. I got it, and then when I got back up a little about an hour later, uh, Ariella was asleep upstairs and I, I went around there and I went right up the steps like it wasn't nothing and I'm like no way no this can't be true and then I turned around I didn't go to her room to wake her up or nothing I literally Dave I ran down the stairs without holding the rails wow I'm not, I'm not and and the thing was was even though I'd been on the X thirty nine, I was beginning to wonder, you know, why is it? You know, you'd think it'd be working by now. And right. I, and Ron was telling me. He said you probably have had a lot of healing in those discs. He said it's just your brain is not reconnected with your uh, nerves yeah. and your legs. Yeah, I've got plates and screws in C three and C four, right yeah. here. Right. And I had staph infection wrapped around and everything else. So. I've come a long way. I mean, like I said, I was bedridden and I can, I'm driving now and, you know, going to the gym, working out four or five days a week and walking with a, with a walker. So, so I've come a long way. Lord's healed me a lot. Amen. Uh, grateful just to be alive and, and, you know, able to share my testimony and, yes. and move forward. My mother was a quadriplegic and now in her case, I prayed for her and over time, she got up and walked. Well, pray, uh, pray for me, brother, sometime. Uh, I'm, in fact, I'm talking good. about it. I've got to go right now. <laughs> All right, brother. All right. God bless you. I love you, brother Dave. Love you guys. Thank you. Right. I don't, I'm not, I'm not coming every, every Thursday. I've got another ministry that I go to on Thursday nights, but probably every other Thursday, I'll be able to make, uh, make, make these meetings. And then are you still having the X39 on Sunday nights? Yep, still doing that, brother. And uh, uh, okay, you know, if y'all guys think it'd be better to back it up some, we can. Uh, doesn't matter to me. Just let me know. So, all right, brother. Thank you. You're welcome. God bless you, brother Dave. Brother Ron, I love you, brother. Suzanne, God love bless you too, your man. sister. So, Suzanne, where are you at? Oh, I'm here. No, but I mean, as far as in the in the country, where are you at? Oh, Milwaukee, and we're having our state fair in two weeks from today, and we are very involved there. So we're crazy busy right now setting up. Wow. Okay. All right. Well, God bless you. It's always nice to see your name pop up on there. Thank you. Thank you. And I like I like to crack jokes about you because I don't see you, so I just sit there and I say, "Well, I'm sure she's smiling." Okay. <laughs> I'm very happy. Um, hey, Sunday night is the X39 group, right? 
Yes, eight o'clock. What time is that? Like on Sunday. Pardon me. Uh, what time is that at, please? Eight o'clock, just like okay. we do here. Eight o'clock Eastern. Eastern. Okay. And it's Banoon X thirty nine or X thirty nine Banoon. No, X39 that one is hub. hub. Right. X thirty nine H U B. X thirty nine Hub. Oh, Hub. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You're very right. welcome, Mister. God bless you. you. Then. All right, brother Ron. God bless you, my brother. Well, you too, my brother. I tell you, oh, I was going to ask you too before I forget it. Did you ever get a hold of Linda? Oh no, let me uh, let me send her a text right now while I'm thinking about it. I keep forgetting to ask about that. And I just happened to think of it. Okay. Yes. I tell you what, I just can't believe that though. The doctor called me and said, "Don't take your thyroid medicine anymore." And I'm like, "Well, he told me." I said, "How will I know?" He said, "When we measure the blood, we'll measure the synthetic and the actual real, you know, okay. the actual hormone." And I was like, right. "I didn't know you could do that." Anyway, he called and told me not to take it. So apparently, me playing with my Pineal gland and stuff, trying to get it to call on that, because that's what caused your TSA. Your uh, it signals the thyroid to send the thyroxin. Right. So I kept messing with that, doing that, and these other things I've been talking to you about, and it seems like it's working. I don't know. You know, I just brother, I'm kind I'm, of excited I'm, about it. Yes, I'm very convinced that your thyroid has grown back. That that's fascinating to me. Do you know about that, Suzanne? No, oh, that's he, great. Wow. His his doctor, uh, his doctor's so puzzled by everything. You know, once he got over the uh uh he had kidney failure, stage four, he got over that. He had congestive heart failure, that's all gone. He had uh a leaky that's valve amazing. in his heart so bad the doctor thought he was gonna die, and he mm -hmm. got over that. And then he had this thing with the thyroid uh, because he had had most of it removed and has been on thyroid medication for years. And had lymphoma in it. Yeah. So now he doesn't have to take thyroid medication anymore and the doctor can't figure out why. Great. Great. I've well, got one more medication. Oh, exactly. yeah. Keep going. Keep going. That's right. <laughs> I've only got one medication now out of 19, and uh, he's wanting to talk to me about that in two weeks. He said he should have that other hemoglobin work and stuff done, and I don't know. You know, just wait to see. Yeah. That's amazing. But that's, that's in your DNA, and he's talking like things are looking different. He's not sure what to do right now, so just <laughs> hang on. <laughs> he's puzzled yes he is oh my goodness all right guys we all have a great night i'm gonna get to bed 